Okay, so we've seen how to derive a downward sloping demand curve, that is, a demand curve which uh, adheres to the law of demand by changing the price of one good, uh, resulting in our optimizing rational consumer choosing to purchase a different quantity of the good in this example we used um, movie tickets. So let's now look at uh, a couple of cases where we change not the price of the product but two other variables which can influence the demand for a product. We're going to look at changing income nominal income, that is the amount of cash the consumer has to spend, their budget, and see what impact that has on the demand curve. And then we'll change the consumer's tastes and see what impact that has on the demand curve. And how to represent that, represent that using the indifference curve budget line analysis. And we'll finish up by looking at uh, reminding, of ourse reminding ourselves that there's a few complications at work here uh, when we're trying to apply this kind of analysis to the real world. So let's get started. Okay, so we're going to be looking at movies and we're going to assume that movies are a normal good. Here we've got the, the, in the top graph, we've got our consumer maximizing their utility, that is, um, satisfying their preferences to the greatest extent they can given the budget constraint that they face. They're choosing to, uh, they're choosing option J, which gives us six movies per month at the price of four dollars a movie. Now, what we're going to do is not change the price of movies, but rather decrease our consumers income so we decrease their income by in our example here uh, we decrease it to 28 dollars from 40. so the budget line shifts inwards parallel uh, until we have the horizontal and vertical intercepts at seven and seven. When that's the case, we come to a. Uh, we have to move the move to a lower indifference curve. And when we reach the tangent of the uh, highest indifference curve, we can get to on the new budget line. We find that the optimal combination of soft drinks and movies is three and three soft drinks and four movies so what we can say is that when the consumer's income has fallen the quantity of movies that they demand has also fallen this is despite the fact that the price of movie tickets has not changed so how would we represent this idea on the graph below with the demand curve. Well, the price hasn't changed. The price is still $4, but the quantity demanded is now lower. It goes from 6 down to 4. And we can so we can represent this by shifting the demand curve over to the left. So that now the new demand curve is the red line. At the price of four dollars, the quantity demanded is now four. So when we change the consumer's income, we shift the budget line parallel, and as a result, the demand curve for the product will shift as well. It'll either shift to the left, indicating a decrease in demand uh, due to a change in income, or it will shift to the right indicating an increase in demand due to the change in income. Incidentally, remember we assumed that movies are a normal good, but how would we represent this situation 
if movies were an inferior good. That is, if movies, if when income falls, the quantity demanded rises. And vice versa, if income rises, the quantity demanded falls. This is the definition of inferior good when that, when that occurs. So how would we represent that on the graph above? All right. That's just something for you to think about. Uh, we might discuss it in class. The next issue is preferences. What if the consumer changes their mind? What if the consumer changes their tastes? So they change the extent to which they like movies compared to soft drinks or not. So here again, we're starting off with our consumer choosing the optimal quantity of um, movies and soft drinks given their income and given the prices of the goods, but also given their preferences, that is, given their preference map. But let's say that our consumer starts to not like movies as much anymore. Their income doesn't change, or their budget doesn't change, and the prices of the goods don't change, so the budget line doesn't go anywhere. The budget line doesn't change. However, the consumer's preferences do, so the indifference map must change to reflect that change in mind of the consumer. So let's say they don't like much movies as much, so we would have to shift their all of their budget, sorry, all of their indifference curves. The old indifference curves become irrelevant, and these new red indifference curves become the new ones, reflecting the consumer's mind. In this case, we can see, even though the consumer's budget hasn't changed, and even the price of even though the price of movies hasn't changed, they prefer fewer movies now than they did before. So when we represent this idea on the graph below for the demand curve, the price of movies stays the same at four dollars, but the consumer doesn't want as many to watch as many movies before. They don't like movies as much anymore. They're not as afire with desire to see movies. Probably because they're all garbage. Anyway, so the quantity demanded falls from four, six down to four, even though the price hasn't changed, due to the change in the consumer's mind. That might be because they simply have a change of heart. It might be because of advertising for some other different product or negative advertising for movies or something they saw on YouTube which told them their lives would be better if they never watched movies again. Whatever it is, their minds have changed and this has to be reflected in changing the indifference map rather than the budget line. Okay, so now we've got to think of some complications uh, with this kind of model that we've represented here. Uh, you can probably think of some problems yourself with this model, um, but we should start out by saying, by rem reminding ourselves that the point of this model, uh, this the point of this theory of how consumers make decisions is to provide a simplified and idealized version of actual flesh and blood decision making. It's meant to capture something about how consumers make decisions in a way that is systematic. However, we have to remember that this is not a representation, so to speak, of flesh and blood consumers. It's not attempting to describe how consumers actually make decisions. That said, sometimes economists become quite enamoured with this theory and inadvertently, let's be charitable, inadvertently come to believe that it's 
it really is a uh, a picture painting representation of the real world and uh, once economists start to think that this is actually describing real consumer choice and the real thinking of consumers then the kinds of problems that start to arise in uh, empirical reality when we see that consumers don't behave that way results in those economists coming up with all sorts of what amount to excuses for why the theory is not working effectively and it kind of becomes um, a little bit embarrassing for those who are on the outside looking at what's going on because because those very economists who are defending that theory often started out defending it on the grounds that they were trying to be scientific what they end up doing is being dogmatic about the theory and anti-scientific in any case let's think of a few problems with it um, one issue that we need to remind ourselves about when we looked at how the model was working was that the various factors which could influence uh, the quantity demanded of a particular product, say the movies, for example, uh, that each of those variables were independent of each other. So, for example, we change price, uh, the, change the price of movies. That doesn't cause the consumer to change their preferences. Um, or if we change the price, that doesn't cause the consumer's income or budget to change. So their money income, so to speak. Uh, we assume that that's the case. But it's possible that these variables could be linked together. By making them independent, by the way, it's very important that they remain independent because that's what enables us to construct a demand curve by changing price and everything else is held constant and then seeing by changing the price what happens to the quantity demanded. That's what enables us to construct a demand curve by holding all the other factors constant. So the problem could be what if in the real world it's not possible to hold all those other factors constant, not just because they're randomly changing, but because they are systematically connected together. What if, for example, an increase in price of a product changes the consumer's perceptions about the nature of the product itself? So an example of this is what's called the Veblen effect. This is where when the price of a good rises, consumers come to believe that because it's more expensive, it's a product which is better able to illustrate the consumer's wealth and the consumer's status. So some consumers may come to like the product more simply because it's become more expensive. And vice versa, if the product becomes very cheap, then consumers might dislike the product because of its cheapness, because it is no longer able to reflect a person's social status. Or it might be a reflection of your social status. If you buy something cheap, it means you're a cheap person and you're poor and uh, therefore you're of a lowly character or something like that. The point is that the change in price might simultaneously cause changes in consumer preferences. That is, the preference map may shift as prices shift, that is, as the budget line changes. And they'll change together simultaneously. Now, if that's true, it's not possible to construct a demand curve where 
all other things remain equal. That is, you only change price, nothing else changes. Because now, preferences are systematically changing with prices. The same sort of story can hold for um, the relationship between price and the budget of the consumers. For example, it's possible that if the price of a good which a consumer is uh, contributes to the production of. So, for example, a consumer works in a factory um, which produces um, petroleum, for example. Uh, and let's say that the price of petroleum rises. And let's further say, because the price of petroleum rises, our workers' income rises to reflect that higher, higher petroleum price. Now let's think about that worker's demand for petroleum. What's happened is the price of petroleum has risen, which has changed, which has shifted their, uh, their budget line. But at the same time, it's pivoted their budget line. But at the same time, their income has risen, so it has shifted their budget line outwards. So the budget line is both pivoting inwards and shifting outwards at the same time. Uh, in this case, it's hard to say how are we going to construct a demand curve now? Because remember our demand curve, constructing a demand curve is premised on the idea that we change only the price of the product and the consumer's income and all of the other factors that affect their decision making and the consumer's income doesn't change. But in this story, which is a plausible story, that is not possible. The price of the product and the consumer's income change together systematically. There's no way to easily construct a demand curve now, a downward sloping demand curve. Another issue which has to do with the, we like, the psychology of decision making is, uh, and this has nothing to do with the technicalities of um, shifting preferences and prices and incomes or anything like that. This is to do really with psychology and that is uh, a number of studies have found that consumers derive a lot of happiness or satisfaction from the ownership, from merely owning a thing. That is to say, for any given thing. Okay, so EPR. What, what's this? A treasury of memorable quotations. I own this. It's mine. I value it at, say, I don't know, uh, $10. Now, if I didn't own this thing, this book, if it were in the shop, how much would I value it at? Well, according to psychological studies that have been done, I wouldn't value it at $10. I might value it at 7 or 5 or something like that. Even though the thing itself is identical, it hasn't changed its nature in any way, but simply by virtue of the fact that I own it, I attribute more value to it than if I didn't own it. And this results in weird phenomena occurring when we think about the indifference map because if you start at a particular combination on an indifference map and say our, let's we can say our consumer um, for some reason or other they've they've uh, chosen a certain combination as of goods as optimal um, and we change the price of a product, 
the consumer will value the goods that they are giving up more than if they were gaining those goods. In terms of the indifference curve graph, it means that if you were going down from left to right along an indifference curve, it would be flatter than if you were going from right to left up an indifference curve for the same goods. So something odd is going on in the mind of the consumer. That is, their preferences change depending on whether they're gaining something or giving it up. It results in very odd things happening to our indifference curves, which make it difficult for, again, to construct uh, stable demand curves. Uh, lucky last is the most obvious one that everyone knows and you probably thought about yourself, and that is um, the completeness assumption. And the completeness assumption says that the consumers know all of the options available to them and uh, and they're able to rank all of their assumptions. Uh, sorry, they're able to rank all of these options from most preferred to least preferred. Now, the obvious problem with this is that most people don't know all of the options and they don't systematically rank all of the options in their heads before they make a decision about which combination of goods to buy. Uh, if you go to the supermarket, you'll see that it would be an insanely complex task to try and rank all of the possible combinations of quantities of the hundreds and hundreds of products that are on the shelves. You could spend, well, if you worked it out, you could spend millions, literally millions of years trying to rank all of the possible combinations that are in the supermarket. No one does that. No one's got the time. Uh, so, and on top of that, no one says, oh, I don't have the time, therefore I'll do something. People don't even think about it at all. Rather, what people will normally do is they will have a small group of products which they have in their minds, which they've already decided on, um, based on past experience of those products, whatever that past experience happens to be. You know, they learnt it from their parents or they saw something on television or whatever. And they've got uh, certain things that they have in mind which they go to purchase at the supermarket and they go and find those things and they buy them. Uh, and unless there's some outrageously obvious change in price they uh, that's out of bounds of what they expected, they pay the price for those products which they've pre-selected. They don't go around looking for lots of different alternatives. That is, for the most part, consumers are habitual creatures. Those habits can be altered slowly um, through time due to a change in someone's lifestyle uh, or a change in their, uh, their cultural surroundings. It can also change uh, quickly if there's some kind of significant uh, impact on the consumer's mind, a really great advertising campaign, or if they've been uh, compelled by their friend that they should buy this kind of product or whatever. That can change the uh, break of consumer's habits to some extent. But by and large, consumers buy habitually. They've got a, a small set of grocery lists, basically, and uh, they basically know what the prices are. And uh, they may do a little bit of experimenting here and there uh, by trying a new product every now and then. Uh, and that's they'll do it by trial and error. They'll decide on whether they like products or not. But they're not really 
setting out to find the absolute optimal combination of all of the conceivable goods and services that are available to them in the economy. So on that ground alone, we would say that this analysis is not very realistic. But again, that said, remember the model is not really trying to be realistic. It's a starting point for building a more realistic analysis, which may involve making the model or the theory that we've seen so far more sophisticated, but it can also mean changing it in a way which ultimately destroys the integrity of that model. Either way, as long as we're coming to more um, satisfactory and predictively accurate um, accounts of how consumers make decisions, it's all good. So that'll do for now.